All right, so welcome everybody to the second of our micro talks. This is on advanced labeling protocols. So just to give you a background of who we are, we are at ICI, the Integrated Cellular Imaging Core, a group of uh, scientists who are biologists, physicists, as well as uh, programmers who can help you uh, design any of your microscopy experiment, help you with microscopy imaging, training, assisting with anything else, as well as um, image analysis. So this is part of our educational series. Um, apart from that, we are also open to consulting and the consultations are free. You can come over, email us at ici at emory.edu. Um, and should any questions that may pertain to your imaging experiments. And again, just to reiterate this, which is I was a grad student once upon a time, I wish something like this existed. You can save a lot of your time, a lot of your money of your PI, uh, as well as all the hair pulling if you just come and talk to us. So that's kind of part on our back to us to and then going back to the grad school experiences. Uh, we are spread across the campus. We have 19 different uh, microscopes. Uh, depending on what you need, we can advise you, guide you uh, to go and use a particular microscope. So we are online, as Neil mentioned, ICA.ember.edu. We are also on Slack for any kind of continued conversations. Feel free to drop by at emeryici.slack.com um, and share anything that you have with, as, as far as, as related to imaging. Okay, so today's agenda um, is going to be discussing various probes for imaging, and this would be chemical probes, fluorescent proteins, um, and mainly immunofluorescence. What I will be spending a bulk of my time will be discussing protocols pertaining to cellular immunofluorescence as well as formalin fixed paraffin embedded immunofluorescence. So some of the feedback that we got from last time is that people want to dive more into discussing some of the protocols. So I will be going in depth in this protocols that I have used um, in my own research in my past life. Um, and I would love to give sort of a technical overview on where the field of multiplex immunofluorescence is at the moment. So while I'm discussing some of these protocols, I'll also um, throw in some of the tips and tricks that I have learned along the way um, from different people, okay? So why do we need to label ourselves? Well, one is really simple, which is I want to do some qualitative imaging, right? You did a bunch of experiments, you, do, you got a bunch of Western blood data, and now it's like, well, I just want a pretty picture. Fine, right? So we can help you out a pretty picture, which is qualitative imaging. However, we also have have lots of microscopes that can help you acquire many, many cells at the same time. So this image is from our Kians microscope that can do multi-XY imaging. And what you are looking over here is a tiny area um, right here. And we can do um, image quantification, figure out what's the fluorescence intensity in the nuclear area. Um, we can draw cellular mask as well as cytoplasmic mask and determine the intensity of these areas, as well as um, definition of any of these structures, could be our actin, could be our mitochondria, and so on, right? So um, if your goal is to compare what's happening upon treatment uh, on cells with different compounds, this is a way to go. So what are the different ways to label a cell? Uh, we can use different chemical probes. Uh, we can use different fluorescent proteins. We can use the, um, immunofluorescence methods to label cells. We can use a combination of these three methods also, right? So for example, when we are doing immunofluorescence, the last step is labeling the nuclei with DAPI. So that's a chemical probe. Um, we can use cells expressing fluorescent proteins. For example, cells could be expressing um, mito rfp right and we can label that with a chemical probe which has to do with actin and we can do some immunofluorescence followed by that so there are different ways to label the cells we can um, use a 
combination of these methods at the same time. However, the use of these methods will depend on your research questions. And it also needs to be determined whether your cells are going to be fixed or live. Now, um, there are different chemical probes available for pretty much all the organelles that you can think of. And one of the good resources to know what chemical probe is suitable for your organelle is to go onto Thermo Fisher's website. They have a good outline for all of this, which I highly recommend you to check out. Um, and there are chemical probes available to investigate and interrogate different cellular processes, right? So you can um, look at the oxidative stress, you can look at cell death, viability, apoptosis, you can look at uh, mitochondrial membrane potential, you can investigate calcium flux. So all of these assays are possible and by and large, all the probes are amenable for live cell imaging more than doing sort of a fixed cell imaging. A lot of the chemical probes that uh, are available are not suitable uh, following fixation process. But as long as your cells are live, a lot of these probes are good. Uh, a lot of companies are there, but I find uh, probes from Invitrogen, which is now Thermo Fisher, Enzo Life Sciences, Immunochemistry, and AppCam uh, to be pretty good. And they also have good resources to look into. Um, and these resources are not just to go and purchase something, but these are also good educational resources. Uh, I want to focus on one specific example of the chemical probe, and that is in relationship with the nucleus. And some of the principles that I'm going to talk about in case of nuclear probe will also be applicable to some of the other probes. So when it comes to nucleus, um, we are very much used to using DAPI or HUX. Now, these are the dyes which fluoresce um, in blue spectrum. DAPI is typically used um, for fixed cells and the cells have to be permeabilized, permeabilized in advance. HUX33342 is used for live cell imaging purposes. Now, the question is, is that a right probe to use? Well, people will say, uh, the only problem with using HUX is that it fluoresces um, in lower spectrum, which is 405. And that spectrum is much more damaging to the cells. And hence, you know, maybe you should not be using it or you should be more careful with it. But is that the only problem with Hux? We will see later. There are other live cell imaging nuclear probes such as DRAC5 and SIRDNA. Now, these are the probes um, which are fluorescent in the far red spectrum, which is 647. And as we go towards far red spectrum, the good thing is um, it's less toxic for cells, right? So are these probes as good as as they are marketed, we will look into that too. And then there are different um, probes such as nuclear mask stains and cyto labels and dyes, um, which are fluorescent across the spectrum, or there are different uh, probes with different fluorescents um, available. Um, and the lastly, I'll talk a bit about uh, the live cell imaging uh, nuclear probes, for example, is to H2B to a nuclear membrane uh, based fluorescent proteins. So let's say directly jump into use of HUX, right? So let's say if you have labeled your cells with HUX and you image your cells um, through transmitted light. So in this example, the HeLa cells have been either labeled with HUX33342 on the right side or there are control on the left side where the cells are not labeled with any dye. And they have been allowed to go on for seven days to see what's the effect of Hux on the cells. Okay, so let's have a look at the effect. And the title itself gives you the answer, which is on the right-hand side, what you see is HeLa cells fail to divide, whereas on the left side, HeLa cells are perfectly fine and dividing and if we were to quantify any of this, what we can see is um, the cells, the control cells in which there is no Hux continue to grow perfectly fine. Whereas cells with Hux, they fail to divide, okay? 
So here's a lesson, which is, it's not just the low wavelength of the light. And here, I did not even use fluorescence. So it's not just the low wavelength of the light, which is a problem when you are using Hux, but Hux, when it intercalates with DNA, there are issues. Now, is this only relevant to Hux? Well, not really. Uh, Sir DNA, which is a uh, silicon rhodamine based dye, and that's a chemical modification of Hux. This also intercalates with the nucleic acids. And what we see in this example is that in both RPE1 cells and U2OS cells, uh, presence of one micromolar of SIR DNA, so SIR DNA and SIR Hux are the same things. Uh, there is a fewer number of cells enter mitosis compared to control. Okay, so not only Hux um, or, any, or any analog of Hux prevents cell division, um, it also affects the number of cells which enter mitosis. Is this all the problem is? Well, intercalation of these dyes to the nucleus also results in DNA damage, which can be quantified by gamma H2X uh, foci or puncta, which is a marker of DNA damage, right? So one has to be very, caref very careful in um, using some of these dyes. And in case of cells, which are expressing histone H2B GFP, what we see is cells are perfectly happy and fine. They will be dividing pretty soon as the movie goes on. <laughs> Right, so we also see good cell division uh, with the cells. All right, so with regards to the nuclear imaging, uh, any dye that binds to the nucleic acids end up affecting the cell function as its and as well as its viability. Uh, all the live cell imaging dyes, for example, live nuclear cell imaging dyes, for example, Hux33342, SirDNA, DRAC5, they are all known to affect um, the physiology of the cell. Hux affects the cell division, SirDNA affects entry of cells getting into mitosis, as well as it's known to cause DNA damage. I did not show the papers where DRAC5 has been shown to have effect on any kind of chromatin associated processes, particularly it dislocates uh, the transcription machinery and induces cell death. And this is something which you will, the link to the paper you will find towards the end of my talk. Um, and if you are planning any long-term time-lapse imaging experiments, which has to do with nucleus, for example, in future you want to quantify cells and expand from nucleus into the cytoplasm or tract, any kind, of, any kind of movement based on the nucleus uh, for your cells, I strongly recommend using histone H2B fluorescent proteins or nuclear membrane, um, which has been integrated with um, any kind of fluorescent protein. All right. Uh, now, some of the principles that I mentioned for the nuclear probes also stand true for some of the other chemical probes. So for example, when you are using any of the mitochondria-based probes, most of the probes get into the cells based on the membrane potential of the cell, right? So if you are doing long-term time-lapse imaging with some of the mitochondria probes, one has to think, will this probe affect the actual mitochondrial physiology of a cell? And all of this also depends on your research question, right? Because if you are investigating uh, mitochondrial membrane potential, but you are using a probe which has to do with mitochondrial membrane potential. And if by in case, by chance, it's affecting respiration and whatnot, it can affect your data. Okay, so think about all those things before jumping into uh, using any of the chemical probes. So switching gears, uh, what I mentioned is I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time discussing protocols, which has to do with immunofluorescence. And what I wanna do is break down every single step of the protocol, okay? So let's say when you are um, doing 
cellular immunofluorescence, what's the first step? The first step is to plate your cells onto a cover slip at a desired density. Now, I have bolded uh, the cover slip over here because at times there are this A12 chamber slides available. And from our experiences, people come to facility with cells on A12 chamber slides, uh, but sure, you have cover slips on top of it, but the cells are adherent to the slide and not to the cover slip, right? So if you want to image cells, uh, using high magnification objectives, that could be a problem at that moment. So if you want to use eight well chamber slides, there are also eight well, eight well chamber cover slip bottom slides available, right? So here's a recommendation from us to use eight well chamber cover slip bottom uh, slides and not the actual thick slides. Uh, once you plate your cells in, on, onto your cover slips or onto uh, your cover slip bottom slides, um, make sure to have appropriate controls. And this appropriate controls uh, could be based on the different treatments that you are using, or um, it could also be integrating simply a secondary antibody only control. Uh, then if you have any chemical probes to integrate um, towards the protocol, feel free and do that. Uh, once you wash out the chemical probe, uh, of course, you have to make sure that your chemical probe is amenable to fixation. Not a lot of chemical probes um, are happy with fixation, right? So make sure you pick the right kind of chemical probes. Following fixation, uh, typically that will be done using 4% formaldehyde fix, uh, which will help fix uh, and cross-link all the proteins. Uh, leave it for room temperature. And I would recommend to prepare formaldehyde in PBS and that to pretty fresh. Uh, in my previous life, I have used 16% um, formaldehyde from EMS, which anytime I would like to use, I would prepare a fresh stock. And once the incubation is done, um, discard formaldehyde based on EHSO's guideline. Um, you can aspirate formaldehyde, wash your um, cover slip twice with PBS. Uh, and also to kind of give a tip over here, which is when you are washing, make sure that you are gentle. Some cells are less adherent than the others. So this will be highly specific to your cell type. When you are doing this multiple washes, some cells can detach from your cover slip, right? So make sure you are gentle if you are using um, sensitive cell lines. Um, and April went over this last time in our first talk, but just want to uh, briefly summarize this, that there are different fixatives available, formaldehyde, methanol, acetone. By and large, formaldehyde is the universal fixative. It works ideally for most of them. The only time that I have used methanol is when I required to uh, permeabilize the cells at the same time. Um, and this was in case of um, actin labeling. But other than that, for most of the immuno labeling that I've done on cells has been based on formaldehyde. And once the formaldehyde fix formaldehyde based fixation is done with, uh, one would permeabilize your cells. Um, typically, I have used um, anywhere from 0.1 to 0.3% Trident X 100 for 10 minutes. Uh, and you can skip the step if the antigen that you are interested in is not intracellular, okay? And then you can wash with PBS. So even when it comes to permeabilization, reagents, there are uh, three different permeabilization agents, Triton X100, saponin, dystonin, and methanol, as I just mentioned a while ago. And April also covered all this three very nicely in her talk uh, last time. So again, I strongly encourage you all to go and uh, look at her talk. Um, if not, here's a nice summary of all the permeabilization agents, the advantages and their disadvantages, okay? Um, if you have any questions on this, I'll be happy to answer at any time. So feel free um, to ask a question in between. All right, so once that's done, the next step is going to be using the primary antibody. 
Uh, with regards to use of the primary antibody and the concentrations, I want to kind of um, state a point, which is we are so used to saying, I use one is to 200 or I use one is to 500 uh, dilution of my antibody. Now, the thing is, the stock concentration of the antibody differs. Uh, the ideal concentration that one would use the antibody at varies anywhere from one to 10 microgram per mil. So when we tell somebody, oh, well, go and use the antibody at one is to 200 or one is to 500, it does not really tell anyone the actual concentration of the antibody. So we should change our mindset and try to say, this is the concentration of the antibody that I have used versus simply saying, I use one is to 200 or one is to 500. Uh, with regards to the incubation times, typically I have used the, um, I have incubated my uh, samples with the antibodies overnight at four degrees C. Um, and one should definitely check out what the manufacturer recommends because they do experiments and they do recommend whether you need to incubate your sample for one or two hours at room temperature or uh, overnight. Now, part of the reason why we end up doing um, incubation at four degrees C overnight is partly because, um, you know, you come in the morning, you start treatment of your cells with uh, different drugs or whatnot. And by the time um, you are done with your primary incubation, it's mostly late in the evening, right? So it kind of makes sense to just leave uh, your antibody onto your sample overnight, come back the next day and start the next step of washing your primary antibody away, using the secondary antibody and the next step. So again, with the secondary antibody, um, typically these are used at really low concentrations, um, about one is to 100. And again, um, I'm as guilty as charged because I just said not to say one is to 100, but I'm again saying one is to 100 because that's so much ingrained in our mentality um, that it has almost become a muscle memory. Um, and you incubate your cells with a secondary antibody for about uh, one to two minutes, and that should be enough, okay? Uh, you wash the secondary antibody, and following which you label your cells with DAPI for about 10 minutes and wash this up. Now, here's a big point to make, which is I strongly encourage you all to use DAPI as a nuclear stain and not anything else. Uh, when, when I say anything else, which is DAPI in the mounting media. The other point I would like to make is if you haven't permeabilized your cells, so if your antigen of interest is on the cell membrane, you probably would like to use HUXT and not DAPI because DAPI can only get inside the cells uh, whose cell membrane is permeabilized, um, which happens at the permeabilization step, okay? Um, and one small little tip over here, which is once you are done with all, all the steps, dip your cover slip in uh, DI water to remove any of the salts, which could be coming from PBS. The reason being, um, if you, let the salts on the cover slip dry. When you come under the microscope, you will have a thin film of salts on the cover slip, which you have to remove from every single cover slip, which is kind of painful. So if you just dip uh, the cover slip in DI water, uh, once the cover slips dry out, um, it's going to be squeaky and clean to begin with. And last step is to mount your sample using an appropriate mounting media. This could be prolonged gold, diamond, of course, without DAPI. And again, when it comes to the mounting media, use just the sufficient amount. If you end up using a lot of mounting media, it's going to take a long time for this mounting media to cure. Um, and second thing is your cover slip might keep on moving back and forth if there is way too much, okay? Uh, apart from that, once it's cured, what, what will happen is your um, cells will be further away and it will, your, your cover slip um, and the slide will have a thicker layer, okay? So with regards to the mounting media and uh, by, by no means, um, I, I discourage you all from using mounting media for other, from other companies. Uh, everything I'm showing you is from Thermo Fisher, which is 
relevant to prolong uh, product, uh, but there are many other mounting medias, but this is going to be a general guide for you to understand what this mounting mediums do, okay? So with regards to uh, the curing times for different mounting media, if we look at the orange line and the blue line over here, which is for prolonged diamond and for prolonged uh, glass, one can see that it almost takes about two to three days for this mounting media medias to achieve complete curing. And when we achieve complete curing, we reach a particular or the best refractive index that this mounting media are designed for. So uh, you should definitely plan your imaging accordingly uh, in, a, in a manner that you give yourself a couple of days once uh, the cover, slip have, cover slips have been mounted. Apart from this, the different mounting medias that we talked about, either prolonged diamond, glass, or gold, uh, gives you a different uh, level of protection from uh, photo bleaching. And we can see that uh, with regards to simple white film microscopy, the prolonged diamond fares to be the best uh, anti-fade or giving you the best protection against photo bleaching. Uh, in contrast, when you look at confocal microscopy, uh, clearly having the laser is much more damaging in terms of photo bleaching uh, onto your sample, right? However, uh, by and large, prolonged diamond is better than prolonged gold. So this graphic can help you decide what mounting media uh, you should use for your um, experiments. Okay, so uh, switching gears um, from immunofluorescence on cells to immunofluorescence on FFPE-based tissue sections. So I want to kind of take a pause over here and see if anybody has any questions. I'll be happy to address them. Um, if not, I'll keep on moving with the uh, immunofluorescence for FFPE tissues. So once you get your slides, um, the first step to do with IF on FFPE is to deparaffinize, right? And one would do this by putting the slides in the oven um, at 60 degrees C for 25 minutes for the paraffin to melt. And while the slides are still hot directly from the oven, one would put the slides to undergo this rehydration process. And in order to achieve the rehydration, the slides are put into xylen followed by 100% ethanol, 95% ethanol, 70% ethanol, water, and PBS. And one would use a Coplin jar for this process. Now, though this is kind of shortened out over here, if anybody wants a detailed protocol for this, please reach out to me. I'll be much more happy to send the protocol to you guys. Uh, the next step is the antigen retrieval. Now, there are different ways of retrieving the antigen. By and large, one would start with boiling the slide in sodium citrate buffer at pH 6.0 and for 30 minutes. Uh, once the incubation is done, one would take this coplin jars out and put that into ice for 30 minutes into an ice bath and then uh, wash with water. Following this, one would perform a bleaching step. Now, this would be an optional. And for those of you who are doing uh, immunofluorescence on FFP, this might be a new step for you. But I find that doing bleaching helps in reducing autofluorescence, which is coming um, from red, red blood cells and tissue in general. And, and this also helps you in a lot of ways because 488 channel is pretty notorious in tissues to give you autofluorescence. So if you end up doing the bleaching step, it opens up one more channel for you to get signal from. So the bleaching step uh, utilizes bleaching solution, which is a combination of hydrogen peroxide, sodium hydroxide uh, made up in PBS. What you do is you dunk your slide um, in a 
light source which has got white LEDs from the sides at room temperature and let your slides bathe in the bleaching solution for one hour. And that's pretty much it. Following this, one can go ahead um, with the permeabiliz permeabilization step, which could be using 0.3% Tridonax um, in PBS for 30 minutes, following which the steps are very much similar to what we did ourselves, which is you would be blocking your sample um, in 5% normal goat serum, um, prepared in 0.1% Tridonax 100 um, in PBS. Now, with regards to blocking, um, typically one would use the, use the blocking reagent, which is compatible with your secondary antibody. But by and large, from my experience, I've seen that 5% normal goat serum works out beautifully for most of the applications. So I would definitely recommend starting with 5% normal goat serum and then figure out um, if you need something else or not. Following this, you would be, yeah. Sorry, I'm interrupting. You have also a couple of questions too that people have about protocols. Would you like for me to redo those questions or would you like to wrap up this, this slide? Sorry to interrupt. All right, let me go and look at the questions. Uh, so uh, Kev, yeah. So Kevin is asking when we are using a cytosol stain such as cell tracer far red, do we concurrently uh, use that or do we wash um, separately? So Kevin, with regards to a uh, cell trace far red, uh, if you are using Hux at the same time, you can stain both of them concurrently. It's not a problem. Uh, but if you are using cell trace far red uh, to track your cells for something, I would not use Hux in that case to begin with. I would use Hux towards the end because as I just mentioned, Hux will affect your cell division and whatnot and cell trace uh, dyes are used uh, to track cells. So you can use them at the same time if you want to image right away. But if your goal is to do a longitudinal study, in that case, use the Hux towards the end. Uh, Jay has a question, mm -hmm. which is, do you mind? So Jay has a question, which is, do you mind commanding on preferred methods for simultaneous fixation slash permeabilization to preserve cytoskeletal structures? Also, what are the best methods for cell um, IF staining on cryosections from tissues? So Jay, I hope uh, I answered part of the simultaneous fixation and permeabilization, which is methanol is a preferred um, fixative, which also causes cell permeabilization to preserve some of the cytoskeletal structures, for example, actin. Um, so that hopefully answers that part of the question. Um, and everything I'm discussing right now in terms of FFP tissue sections, that is also uh, relevant for the cryosections. What, the only thing I would say is for cryosections, you do not need to do any kind of antigen retrieval um, because there is no uh, paraffin embedding. So except for the antigen retrieval step, a lot of the steps that are part of this process. Uh, so let me go back over here. So except for one, two, and three steps, you can directly start from bleaching step if you want to use your 488 channel, um, followed by permeabilization and so on. So I hope uh, that answers that part of the question. Um, and uh, Mingli has a question, which is when we stain the membrane protein in cells, um, do we need permeabilization or not? So definitely if you are, so with regards to membrane protein, so if your protein is on the surface of the cell, you do not need permeabilization. Um, however, if your membrane protein is in the inner leaflet of plasma membrane, then you will need some sort of permeabilization, okay? Uh, can you comment on uh, tween 20 for cell permeabilization. So I have kind of used a Triton X and Teen Tween 20 uh, back and forth. Uh, and I cannot recollect exactly what those applications were at this point. Uh, but I can go back, look at some of what I some of what I did and uh, under what applications and get back to you. So in, in all honesty, I by and large, I've used Triton X, but only occasionally I've used uh, Tween 20. 
uh, yeah, that, that, that's what I want to end this. So I can get back to you, uh, Nia, with, with your question later on. All right, so uh, moving on with the next step for FFP. So we did the blocking. We are at the primary antibody step. You know, you, you incubate your cells with primary antibody in the antibody deletion buffer overnight at 40 degrees C. You wash it three times, 15 minutes each. Secondary antibody, just that we did before for cells, um, do nuclear staining with DAPI for 10 minutes, wash that out. Uh, dip the cover slips and mount using an appropriate media, and you end up getting beautiful signal, right? So um, at this point, with this example, what I want to show to you is compare the autofluorescence um, when your sample is bleached versus not bleached, right? So when I say bleaching, we are again going to talk about this particular step which I said is optional, most people don't do, but if you do it, what kind of differences and changes that you see. So in this example, what you are seeing is a tissue which is spleen, and the animal was irradiated with x-ray. Um, they got about 10 grays of irradiation. Um, and the spleen contains immune cells, um, which are part of this follicles, uh, they are extremely sensitive to irradiation and they are expected to die. Um, and the sample was labeled with antibody against caspase 3 and hence all these dead cells that are undergoing apoptosis are expected to light up in the magenta channel. What, however, what you are seeing in the green channel is autofluorescence and that's coming simply from the red blood cells which are part of the spleen as well as any of the tissue autofluorescence, okay? So, and this is the unbleached sample. When we bleach the sample, um, what you see is there is complete loss of the green autofluorescence. And when we uh, quantify this regions, what we see is there is the, the mean fluorescent in intensity for the 488 channels is about 3000, whereas once you bleach it, the mean fluorescence intensity is about 200, right? So this enables us to get good signal to noise ratio for any of the antibodies that we want to use in the 488 channel. Um, so these are the comparisons for the 488 channel, for the 550 channel, 555 channel. Uh, these are the comparisons. So for 555 channel, as we go higher in our spectrum, the autofluorescence also reduces. And this is kind of a classic example of that, which is we have got higher autofluorescence in 488 channel, the autofluorescence goes down as we go higher in wavelength. And under both situations, when you bleed the sample, uh, there is a reduction uh, in autofluorescence in the non-follicular area that we are looking over here, okay? Now, so in conclusion, bleaching helps in removal of tissue autofluorescence. However, what you would have also noticed is that there is sort of a reduction in the caspase three fluorescence in the follicular area. So bleaching almost decreases the signal that you get. So I do not know if bleaching is affecting the antigen um, sites or what, but it, definitely decreases your signal by about twofold. At the end of the day, in microscopy, all we care about is signal to noise ratio, right? And even if you have, let's say, 5,000 uh, mean fluorescence intensity, or you have about 2,500, it's okay. You can always visualize this as long as your signal is few folds higher than background, you are good, right? So I would not really worry about this reduction in the signal intensity between unbleached versus bleached sample, okay? Um, and the other thing I want to really talk about is conjugation of primary antibodies to fluorophores. So everything we talked earlier was about um, using a primary antibody, using a secondary antibody. But one of the major limitations of that is there are only a limited combination of different species that you have for primary and secondaries. 
um, sometimes you go in to buy something and you are like, oh, okay, I don't have the second one. So let me go and buy that. Um, and from my experience in the freezer, you will have accumulation of lots and lots of antibodies. And it's not that antibodies are cheap, right? So if you are able to use a primary antibody that you can conjugate to a 404, this reduces unnecessary purchase of a palette of different species of antibody that, that you might be accumulating over the time. Um, and from my experience, when I have used a labeled antibody, and even though this labeled antibody is the same clone as that of a primary antibody, sometimes it doesn't work the same way. You, you would expect the same clone um, conjugated to a fluorophore or non-conjugated to work the same way, but it does not. So if you have a way of um, conjugating a primary antibody in-house, um, it's also going to reduce some of the time that it takes to run the protocol. And also more importantly, it will allow you to multiplex something which we will see in successive slides, okay? Now, if you think about conjugation of like, oh my God, you know, I need to um, do multiple centrifugation steps and whatnot, it's gonna take me a long time to conjugate a fluorophore to the antibody. Well, there are some new products available which really removes this pain which used to be true about a few years back. So one of the favorite that I have is the xenon conjugation kit from Thermo Fisher. And when I was recommended to use this kit, I was a skeptic, which is, is it really going to work? But it's magic. It, it works like magic. So the way uh, the xenon conjugation kit works is you take your target specific antibody, you purchase the kit which has got um, FABs, which are linked to fluorophores, all you have to do is simply incubate these two things, you know, and you get your labeled um, antibody right away to use. And it seems that can it really work? But the fact is it does work really, really well. Okay. So I strongly recommend for you all to go and check out um, xenon conjugation kits from Thermo. And I don't get any money from Thermo because I've been talking about using thermal products that are also products available from AppChem, for example, their Lightning Link um, product, which I have not used, um, but it's there. That's why in all fairness and all transparency, I'm putting that out to here, okay? Now, how do you get the best output from the conjugation? So to begin with, uh, the, cons the starting material, which is your primary antibody, should be of a higher concentration. Because as you keep on moving with uh, the dilution step, you are diluting your antibody by about 10 folds, right? So at the end, you have to use higher um, dilution of the antibody. Uh, the other thing is you need to know what your primary, what the buffer in the primary antibody is, whether it contains azide or some kind of other storage buffers, um, which can affect the conjugation process. Um, the choice of the label is again very important. If you think that if you are conjugating your primary with a fluorophore and that's not giving you a strong signal, one can use part instructive in conjugate um, to again boost your signal and amplify the fluorescence. And of course, at the end of the day, controls are very important. So definitely use a uh, non specific uh, fluorophore or some, a fluorophore which has not been conjugated to the antibody and see how it's behaving, okay? So that's a nutshell um, covering conjugation of uh, fluorophore to the primary antibody. And it works like magic. It really helps you to expand the palette of different um, antibodies that you, that you can use at the same time and that you can multiplex, right? So. Multiplex immunofluorescence is a big thing these days. And it's a big thing for a reason because diseases and any of the associated pathology with diseases is very complex, right? Um, especially in the field of inflammation, in the field of immuno-oncology, one is always interested in knowing what cell types are contributing to either uh, the presence of hot tumors or presence of cold tumors. And the only way to understand that um, is if you use antibodies towards different cell types, use antibodies 
towards different proteins within the cell types, right? Um, and there is a huge push these days uh, to create single cell atlas of humans, of mice, uh, in disease state, as well as in healthy states. So once you understand how spatially the tissues are composed, how cells are interacting in a healthy environment, as well as in a disease environment, it can help us to tease different things. Uh, it can help us to understand how a particular cell type is involved in disease progression or how a particular protein within this cell is involved in disease progression. And this can eventually help us to guide towards new therapies. So how do we end up doing um, multiplex immunofluorescence? So at Emory um, Cancer Tissue and Pathology Core, they have a Vectra Polaris and a lot of groups at Emory are in fact using Vectra Polaris for this. Um, where they use the antibodies, um, you can do six plex and at most this allows you to do um, seven color multispectral imaging, right? And uh, what happens, one of the problem with this kind of a multispectral imaging is that there is a lot of bleed through that happens. And this is obvious um, from this graph over here where we are looking at emission of different opal dyes which are used in this process. So because of this bleed through, one has to use a customized software from Vectra Polaris to figure out how much of bleed through contribution is in each of the dyes to tease out uh, the fluorescence from individual channels, right? So that's again uh, with Vectra Polaris where one is using opal dyes, which only lets you do up to seven different colors. But what if you want to know more about different cell types and the contributions coming from them. So there are different platform technologies that one can utilize, and I will call this highly multiplexed immunofluorescence. This allows you this allows for up to use of hundred different antibodies. So the platform, which is sort of open source that anybody can use and is relatively cheap, is the cyclic immunofluorescence. Uh, this was developed at the Laboratory of Systems Pharmacology at Harvard Medical School. And then there are some of the commercial platforms, for example, Maxima, Saldive, and Codex from Multani, Leica, and Acquia Biosciences. So what I'm going to do is talk about the principles of each of these platforms, how this is going to work out. Um, and it's good to know some of this cutting edge stuff, okay? Not necessarily that you will be using. Um, and again, we don't have all these platforms because the commercial platforms are very expensive. But if any one of you would like to um, use cyclic immunofluorescence for, for your labs, do reach out to me. Um, I'll be happy to help you with that. So with regards to highly multiplex immunofluorescence um, regarding CISIF, it involves a very simple process, which is you pre-stain um, where I told you about bleaching step. It's the bleaching step that you do to remove any kind of background fluorescence. Following this, you label your uh, cells with the primary antibody or primary antibody, which is conjugated to fluorophores. And at a time you use blue, which is 488, uh, red, which is 568, and far red, which is 647, right? So use any three antibodies. You do nuclear staining with DAPI, uh, then you go and image your sample. So now you have four channels that you are imaging, your blue, green, red, and far red. Followed by that, you do fluorophore inactivation, the bleaching step that I mentioned to you. And you repeat this process, right? So you take three new set of antibodies, repeat this process, take three new set of antibodies, repeat this process. And once you are happy with whatever you need, um, you can use the same slide for HNE uh, for, for any kind of evaluation to be performed by a pathologist, okay? So this is kind of an example from one of the data sets from CISIF folks. And I would love to show uh, the platform that they have. So you can access their data sets uh, at CISIF.org. And uh, this is a melanoma precancer atlas. So if we go to one of the images, and this tool not only serves for you to check out different things, but it's also a great educational tool to understand the structure of any tissue type, to understand how the disease progression is happening 
and how different um, antibodies are going to behave uh, for different uh, groups, okay? So if I zoom into this particular group, uh, one can divide this based on the immune markers. So that's CD163, CD3, D, CD20, MART1, um, and so on. If you want to see interaction of immune cell types with cell types which are involved in progression of melanoma, we can go to the next channel and look at um, some of the markers for that. We can look at the markers for T cells, and um, this can, and we can use this kind of a principle to then do image analysis to look at proximity of different cell types, proximity of the cell type within a particular region in a disease tissue, and so on. Right. So this is just a cool example, not just to um, look at how different antibodies work, but also to learn a bit about um, cancer immunology. So coming back over here, now what are the difficult things about an open source system like this? Well, the difficult thing about an open source system like this is how do you align the images that are coming out from different cycles, right? So we are having four different channels for every round. So how do we align multiple channels that keep on coming from different rounds? So the folks at LSP have developed an open source software called Ashlar, which utilizes DAPI from each of the rounds to align the cells, okay? So it's important to align the cells um, to figure out where each of these antibodies are for different processes. Um, they do image analysis using custom scripts. However, there are open source programs, for example, QPAC available that one can use, or there are, oh, there are commercial softwares that one can also utilize uh, for whole slide image analysis. And any microscope can be used as long as it can do multi-XY imaging. And at the core, we have got uh, multiple different microscopes that are capable of doing multi-XY imaging. For example, Kians, Nike and Crest, like SP8, and so on. Okay, so this is really possible to do uh, within the core. Um, so if you have, if you need any help or support uh, with doing SISIF, um, do reach out to me. I'll be happy to help. Uh, the other commercial technologies are Maxima, which is from Botany Biotech. Now they have made an instrument itself, which is just this nice little box. Um, which is fully automated, has a microscope and close within the box, uh, has nice microfluidic system and built-in software for image analysis. Now, when it comes to the antibodies, again, it works with the same principle, which is you stain, you image, you erase, and you repeat. They have developed a series of antibodies, um, which they call the re-affinity antibodies or release dye antibodies, where um, you can erase the fluorescence either by photobleaching or you can remove the fluorochrome in a controlled manner from the antibody, okay? And what the Miltani people say is it takes about an hour to two to stain your sample uh, versus with Sisef, typically you um, label them overnight. So it, uh, every round, every cycle is one day process. Whereas over here, according to the Miltani people, it's a couple of hour process so you can squeeze in multiple rounds in the same pro in, in the same time. Um, then, well, pardon, this is um, from, this is Cortex from Aquaria Biosciences and not Sisif. So the next example is that of uh, uh, Cortex from Aquaria Biosciences where they work a little bit in a different manner, okay? So what they do is they have a panel of antibodies. So let's say you have 60 different antibodies that you want to um, investigate. So they have a panel of antibodies that you can use onto your tissue, uh, which is the first step. Um, the second step is addition of the reporters. And if you see over here, the antibodies have this oligo tag. Now there are reporters that go and bind to this oligo tags. You image these reporters, you remove these reporters and you continue this process, right? So that's how you get this cyclicity. And considering that you, you have all the antibodies present at the same time and removing uh, the oligos or the reporters is a fast process, uh, you can finish this experiment much more faster 
with Codex technology. So according to Akoya Biosciences, uh, you got a microfluidic system, which is compatible with any existing microscope. So this is key ends according to their um, schematic and the core also has a key ends. They also have a built-in software for image analysis, okay? So in nutshell, one of the biggest question is about antibody validation. How do you validate this antibodies that you are using? Because now we are talking about many antibodies. So in case of size of the folks at LSP, they do in-house validation of the antibodies. Um, if you do not have an antibody, which is conjugated to a fluorophore, you can conjugate the fluorophore using the kits that I just mentioned. Uh, with regards to companies, for example, Multani, they themselves have a big business in case of antibodies. So uh, there are plenty of antibodies available from them. There are antibodies which are part of the panel that they sell, that they have validated, uh, that one can purchase. Uh, with regards to Leica, they have partnered with different vendors to give you validated antibodies. And Codex, again, has a panel of antibodies that can be used for specific purposes. So one of the things that I'll tell you over here is, if you need any of these antibodies uh, from my experience, just go and talk with the scientific representative of any of these companies, and they will be very happy to suggest to you list of validated antibodies so that you don't have to waste your time and money behind figuring out whether or not the antibody that I'm purchasing is going to work or not, okay? So there's a question from Katie, which is for this uh, multiplexing purposes, the tissue hold up over multiple rounds of IF, do you need thicker tissue section? So Katie, the tissue does hold up over multiple rounds of IF. Um, for example, folks at, uh, folks who do SISIF at LSP, they have done 50 rounds and the tissue does hold up very nicely. Uh, so that's pretty much it that I wanted to cover. Um, these are some additional links and references to some of the things that I was talking but uh, were not part of the presentation. Um, and I also want to thank folks at LSP with whom I had great time learning from, a few of the things that I presented today while I was uh, a postdoc uh, at Harvard School of Public Health. Um, and with that, thanks to all of you for spending your valuable hour with us today. Thanks, Grav. Beautiful. Thank you for the lovely talk. Um, so questions. Uh, I think um, we've addressed the questions in the chat. I don't know. Anybody want to jump in, turn on screens and have a chat about different things? Let it kind of marinate for a minute, maybe, and then kind of jump in there with something that uh, they've been working on, something that they've done before, even some tips, even some things that kind of corroborate what we've been talking about in different directions and something specific to your work or your tissues or your labels that you may want to share, you know, let, let us know and join in and let other people know. And don't forget, feel free to, to jump in on the Slack group and you know, share a few things there if you need to on our labeling channel. Um, it looks like it looks like people are heading off maybe to the two o'clock. We did run a little longer than some, some talks. Okay, cool. Oh, well, the, the recording is going to be available soon. Um, we'll get that up to YouTube and get the link out. And we have a next one coming up is I'm going to give, which is um, technique awareness, I believe. Uh, it's going to be about the different different types of microscopy available, um, of which we have most of them in the core, but we can talk about all the different available types and, what, and how they differ and, and what different types are good for in that way. Okay. Thank there's you one more question. I'm sorry. So, oh. Neil, before we head out, there's one more question from Azana. On, oh, on the topic of labeling fixed cells, do you have any Yeah. On the topic of labeling fixed cells, do you have any comments on mounting media with um, And is it recommended to use a non mounting media without DAPI and nail polish to mount cover slips? So, Azana, uh, I would like to reiterate, reiterate that. Um, you should not use a mounting media with DAPI. Definitely, definitely use a mounting media without DAPI. Uh, from the experiences, it results in a lot of background. Uh, there might be some precipitates that come out here and there. 
Um, and using DAPI, which takes five minutes to 10 minutes um, of your life is much more simpler and easier stuff. Uh, mounting cover slip, it depends on your mounting media. If your mounting media is non-hardening, then definitely you have to use a clear polish to um, seal the edges. But if your media is hardening, um, you, you can do away without using a nail polish. So it depends on the mounting media that you are using. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you everybody coming and we'll catch you uh, next, next week.